Oh, what the hell is that? <gasps> Just went. Oh, frick, did man. did did you see it? I did. There it is. Bro, see? It was peeking around. Unexplained cases is supported by Carrie Nyon and Cullen Therapies. In Calvert County, Maryland, along the shore of the Patuxent River, the 260-acre King's Landing Park is a wonderful location to experience history and nature. Once an active farm and later a YMCA camp, kayakers, canoeists, fishermen, nature lovers, and families enjoy King's Landing Park for its access to the river, creeks, marshes, and hiking trails. Picnic areas are available for small and large groups. Large pavilions require reservations, and an event hall is also available for rent. Captain John Smith, the English explorer who played an important role in the establishment of the colony at Jamestown, Virginia, explored the region between 1607 and 1609. Also, British warships chased the American fleet up the river during the War of 1812. History at King's Landing Park is being experienced in other ways. Driving onto this peaceful and beautiful property, it's difficult to imagine it being a paranormal hotspot. But if almost 30 years of investigating the paranormal has taught us anything, it's to never underestimate a location. Never judge a proverbial book by its cover. Ready to do uh, a uh, investigation. This is our base camp. We interviewed four park staff, two former and two employed at the time. Each shared similar and unique experiences. All happened while they were working at the park. All are unexplained and quite unforgettable. Meet Ben Kraus. At the time of this investigation, Ben was a park ranger at King's Landing. Ben has also led ghost tours for years, so he's rather familiar with hauntings. We meet Ben at the Tom Wisner Hall, our base camp for the evening. Ben shares about the hall's namesake. Tom Wisner was called the Bard of the Chesapeake. He was one of the first major um, Chesapeake Bay uh, environmental uh, science proponents, but also uh, trying to protect it. It's because of him that we have programs like the Chess Packs program, which is run by the state. We actually have two of their buildings over there. But when Tom passed away, Patuxent Hall, what we're in now, was uh, named Tom Wisner Hall by Governor O'Malley. This desk was just given to us last year. Uh, it was gotten along with everything you see here as part of his estate sale when he passed. Uh, so this is his desk where he wrote all of his music and all this here was all a part of his uh, estate, even the painting, um, record, books, and all the artwork Tom did himself. Before we begin an investigation, Often, even before we exit our vehicle, we protect ourselves with a prayer. So, considering the amount of activity, especially in this location, um, it is very appropriate uh, that some protection um, get going. And so, uh, part of our investigations is always to have uh, a prayer uh, opening before and then closing as well. So, we need to do that right now. So, Father God, Lord, we just thank you for today for an opportunity to be here. Um, Lord God, I just pray for your protection that would be surrounding and encircling Mike, myself, and Ben, that, Lord, that we are fully protected by your warrior angels, that nothing evil, malevolent, or anything that could cause us harm can get to us, uh, that that is completely 
pushed away from us, that we will be safe tonight in investigating this location, um, and that no, uh, n no interference uh, of a dark kind will be able to come towards us since we are here in love and light and under the protection of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that I ask all of this. Amen. Even before we finish setting up base camp, Unexplained Cases lead investigator and researcher Mike Chin has two unusual experiences. Hey, like, did you call my name when I was walking out the door? Like just now? No, when I was walking, yeah, when I was walking out. Didn't say a word. <laughs> Hold on a second. So, you just went outside to get something out of the car. Yep. And you thought you heard your Be name because called. Oh, you thought you heard me or... You. Uh -huh. Because we were talking... And then I was walking out the door, and I was about two feet in front of the door, ready to push on the handle, and I thought I heard you say something, like, call my name, like, Mike. And I went out and came back in. Interesting. That's my story. Did you hear that? It sounded like somebody was walking. <clears throat> sounded like a some kind of movement noise, and then I heard like sort of sounded like somebody was walking, and it ended. Apparently, hearing footsteps in this hall is a common occurrence. Hearing footsteps occasionally, that was more rare, but it did happen. Where in the in that main um, banquet hall, every so often you would hear footsteps and. Sometimes I would hear footsteps and I mean, like really to the point where I would get up and go to the hallway and be looking around like, is somebody in here? And there was nobody there. We eventually step away from the hall for a bit, locking it up with trigger objects and video monitoring. While outside, Ben shares with us how he often uses dousing rods for communication and sometimes their behavior can be rather unexpected. That we do sometimes. Freaking way, dude. <laughs> that is crazy. When that happened for the first time, it was during one of the first tours on the first year, and it completely blew my mind. He also shares one of many unusual experiences he and another staff member had relating to a door that no longer exists. There once was a door that was here. Ah, the door is no longer here. Yes. <laughs> Has not been here for at the very least 16 years, because that's when I started working here. And it was long gone before that. So um, I'm going to say those photos from were from 1988. It's probably been since the 80s that that door hasn't been here. So we still hear that door shut to this day. So How often does that happen? Uh, not often. Uh, but not once in every blue moon either. I'd say maybe once every four or five months I hear it. Okay. But I can only speak for myself. There's so much stuff that goes on here, but we don't compare notes every single day we get together. Melinda Witcher, the second park manager during my tenure here, uh, very religious woman, totally believes in the paranormal. We were in the office one day and we heard a door slam from over here. There was no one else in the park. It was one of those days. It was just us. That's why we were just randomly hanging out in an office. So hearing a door slam, that that's weird any day when no one's in, but even more weird when no one's even in in the park. So we checked all the doors. They were all locked. Uh, we went into the supply closet, slammed that door because maybe the air conditioner pushed it closed, but it didn't even sound the same. We turned the air conditioner on and off to see if the click and the bang of the unit was it. No, nothing sounded the same until we got to the screen door on this end, which was thoroughly locked, by the way. But when we pulled it shut, we were like, wait, that was it. But it, that couldn't have been it. 
a little bit later, not the same day, but maybe a few days to a couple of weeks later, she was going through some old photos, the photos I was just talking about. And uh, I came in to work around 1230 and she goes, look at this, points at the door. And it needed no explanation. I knew exactly what she was talking about. We return to the event hall to determine if there's been any activity. Listen closely to what Mike mentions hearing. We then record two unusual sounds. The entire clip will play. Mike hears a knock, and this sound will be enhanced for you. Immediately following that is what sounds like a female voice, but we cannot determine what is being said. Can you? Hmm? I wonder if they're hearing like a woman's voice. Where at? Upstairs. We were like in front of the building and we were walking up to it. Yeah. And walking up the side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was that? What was that? What was that? What was that? While the first noise could have possibly originated from an ice machine, or the building settling, the female voice is impossible, as there were no women in the building or on the park grounds. That was weird, because that was kind of like a voice. Before we get into our investigation, listen to what two former employees and a then current employee experienced on the park grounds. So as the park manager of King's Landing, you are steward of the land. So taking care of trails and the wooded areas, the meadow areas, um, there's a pier. So it's uh, watching over fishermen, making sure that people are using the, the nature trails and everything appropriately and um, also doing reservations. We did camping there and weddings and some other events. And the thing is, is the park manager of King's Landing is the only full-time uh, person at King's Landing. So I literally sometimes had to do every job from opening to close. It just, cause I was the only one there. But I can tell you that very early on, I had eerie feelings of being watched and um, uh, just a, an overall kind of just creepy feeling. Like uh, I'd be on a trail or closing up for the evening and I was by myself and I just felt very, very uneasy. I'm going to start with the toilet flushing by itself, which maybe seems like a small thing, but when you are in a building by yourself and the park is almost completely empty and you're just sitting there quietly at your desk working on something and all of a sudden the toilet flushes, it's off-putting. And um, so I had been told that the, um, the toilets are the, the kind that are motion sensor. And so they, um, uh, maintenance mechanics would tell me, oh, it's probably insects flying in front of the motion sensors, you know, and I, I kind of let that go a little bit. Um, but one particular time I was in my office and I was by myself and the toilet flushed by itself repeatedly for over 15 minutes. It just kept flushing. And when I would open the door and go in there to look at it, it would stop. So I eventually called the maintenance mechanics and said, listen, I need you to come over here right now because it's just continually flushing. It's wasting water. I don't know what's happening. You need to come and take a look at it. And uh, about maybe less than five minutes before the maintenance mechanic arrived, it stopped. So he came in, he checked it. He said, everything's working perfectly. 
uh, nothing's wrong with the motion detector, everything on it is fine. I said, okay. And so he left and within five minutes, the toilet started flushing again. <laughs> and um, so at that time, we had had many discussions about having uh, entity at King's Landing. So we actually had a little tape recorder. So I turned the tape recorder on and I went into the bathroom and I just tried to talk to it and just said, is anyone here? Um, what do you want? Can I help you with something? And I didn't get any sounds and the toilet at that point had stopped flushing. And so I said something like, oh, well, now that I'm in here, you're not gonna flush the toilet anymore. And the toilet flushed. And I was like, okay, at that point, my heart kind of dropped because I felt like it was an answer to what I had just said. And I opened the door and I left and said, okay, well, I guess I'll talk to you later. And I went and I listened to the recording really dimly in the background because I had said, so I guess since I'm in here, you're not gonna talk anymore. And the toilet flushes and you can hear a voice say, you're right here. And I gotta tell you, it scared the living crap out of me. <laughs> um, like it basically told me I'm not flushing the toilet anymore because you're standing here. That's what I wanted. And, and it was pretty horrifying. So um, the end of that story is just after I had left that last time and was listening to the recording, it, it, it stopped. It just didn't do it anymore. In the evenings when it was closing time, we had an all-terrain vehicle and basically you would have to take it everywhere in the park just to make sure that there were no people there because you don't want to close the gate obviously and have people still in the park. So one evening I was doing this and, and it wasn't dark out, but it was dim. And as I was driving past my car, which um, to try to give you some perspective, my car was like across a football field away from me, but it was facing toward me. And as I was driving, I just glanced over and looked at my car and my headlights came on and then they turned back off again. And I was like, oh, that can't have, that can't have just happened. I had to have, something had to have caught it or something. So I actually put the ATV in reverse backed up and then drove again and looked over and nothing, not even a blink. So I was like, okay, so something just turned my headlights on for about two seconds and turned them back off. My keys were next to me actually in the ATV on the passenger seat. So it wasn't, I didn't accidentally hit my keys. Um, my headlights just turned on and then turned off. My car was completely off and a football field away from me. So the other thing for you to know is that I am a Girl Scout troop leader. And so I um, often camp at, at King's Landing, or I did camp at King's Landing with my girls. And one time we stayed in one of the cabins and uh, nothing happened when the girls were there, thank goodness. But I did leave some items in the cabin overnight that I figured I would just pick up on Monday. So, Monday, I was by myself, and this was the middle of the day. And I went over to the cabin, and it I had that eerie feeling. Um, and I, I mean, I had slept in there two nights earlier and was fine, and had, you know, six little girls in there with me, and I was fine. But going over there on Monday to pick everything up, I was alone, and I don't know, I just felt very creeped out. So as quickly as I could, I opened the cabin door, I went in, I grabbed the things that I had left and it was like a backpack and um, an archery set. And I put them on my back and I walked out. And when I left, I locked the door and you know, when you lock a door and then you close it just to make sure it's locked, you just kind of shake the handle, you know? And so I shook the handle, just that little and walked away and I got about 20 feet away. And behind me, I heard, chuk, 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 chuk. I mean, like exactly the sound that I had made when I shook the handle to make sure that the door was locked before walking away. I'm like shaking thinking about this story. It was horrifying. <laughs> um, I, I 
never went into that cabin ever again. <laughs> One of the uh, campers was couldn't sleep because something was talking to her all evening. And it was the camper who that floating head is like right next to. Oh, it was that same camper. This little girl just was up all night because voices were talking to her and the other little girls in the tent were getting annoyed because they were like, oh, we can't sleep. So they, they were actually going and getting the other counselor and bringing the counselor back like, hey, can you tell her to stop talking? And this poor little girl was hysterically crying. And she was like, I want to stop talking, but they won't leave me alone. And the other wow. girls in the tent were like, we're not talking to her. We don't know what she's talking about. Right. And she just, I, I mean, was hysterical and crying because she just couldn't, the, whoever was talking to her was not leaving her alone. She did end up going home the next day because she didn't, she didn't get any sleep and she was just, I, I mean, I can't imagine her state of mind the next morning. Both of these photos that I'll show you were taken back to back. The Girl Scout leaders are just going ch -ch 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 -ch. And so um, we've blacked out the faces because they're all underage. Um, but you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to this girl here because she's the one central to the story. Mm -hmm. So the Girl Scout leader, when she found these photos, she did not initially give them to us. Um, she was just kind of keeping them. And then Melinda Witcher, uh, the second park manager here, um, she was a Girl Scout leader. So like once a month they have like all the Girl Scout leaders get together. So they were, they, they were getting together and Melinda was advertising the ghost tours because she was very excited about this new thing. And that's when the leader pulled her aside after the meeting and showed her these photos. So this is the first one. So you'll look at this girl here in this black space because in the next photo taken just a split second afterward. Ooh, and I'll blow it up for you guys. That's crazy. So the story that Melinda got told by the Girl Scout leader who ended up going on one of my tours and filled in even more of the gaps mm -hmm. is that this girl here that he's kind of looking at mm -hmm. um, late that night, she uh, was tossing and turning and this Girl Scout leader heard her mumbling. So Girl Scout leader goes over to her tent and says, what's going on? She goes, the little boy won't stop talking to me. A little bit later, she starts getting real sick, clammy, headache, stomach ache, just like that kid Chris that I told you about earlier. This is like four or five years later. Mm -hmm. um, all of the same symptoms, parents had to be called, came and picked her up at the gate around three in the morning. Um, she got immediately better when she left. So I, I think she was a victim of the black mass and whoever this kid is, if what uh, the medium Lori, the victim I told you about earlier, says is true and that he's still here, then that means these kids may have known him. So I, I, look, one girl, two ghost experiences in the same night within hours of each other, that's right. not a coincidence to me. I wonder if he's trying to warn her about something. And it's just always been my pet theory. Did um, anything happen to her? Nope, the minute she left, A-okay. Uh, I gave a ghost tour to Cub Scouts and one of the Cub Scout leaders who also had worked here for a little bit, Billy. Um, Billy told me about one of his campers uh, a few years back had had a very similar thing happen. So it happens, but I mean, what's a, a, a Cub Scout or Girl Scout leader going to say? Oh, one of my kids got sick? I mean, no. <laughs> I would say that the, the toilet flushing would happen with some regularity. There was a light um, in one of the public bathrooms that would come on by itself and would very often be on in the evening when I was leaving for the night, even though nobody had been in there all day. Um, and you would go in there and try to turn it off and it wouldn't. It was like one of those push button ones. I believe that there's something. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it is uh, dead people's spirits or if it's a uh, demonic presence or, uh, you know, it, there's something, but I, I don't know what it is. But there's definitely something that is not science, that's not detectable, that is paranormal. Um, I'm just not willing to put the tag on it because I don't, I don't know. No feeling of, of having a, a presence anywhere near me.
not since I left. My day started, um, I think around seven o'clock in the morning. Um, during the summer, um, you know, it was fairly light in the morning. However, when it got closer to uh, winter time, it was dark in the morning. Um, and then we worked till about four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and our typical day was meeting there um, at the park and uh, getting everything ready um, that we needed for the day, our mowers and weed whackers. And we would uh, figure out our plan for the day. And, um, and then we would dispatch from that park. Um, and uh, some days we would either be working there at that park or we'd be um, getting in our trucks and trailers and going to another park to work. Um, I did uh, winter maintenance as well. Uh, we were called in uh, for snow removal um, on the roads within the parks. Um, we also uh, removed snow on the sidewalks um, and, and various things um, associated with the winter time. Most of the time um, I was by myself. Um, there was only a couple of us working. Um, so, and there was a lot of parks that needed to be maintained. So most of the time I was by myself working. I would say the first time that I can recall um, was when I was in our park office by myself. Um, our office shared the same wall as the public bathrooms um, that were in the park as well. Um, and so I was always aware of activity that was happening over there. Um, it was a simple cinder block wall. There was no insulation, there was no drywall. Um, so it was easy to hear what was happening um, around the building and on the other side of the wall as well. Um, and I'd have to say that um, the first accounts that I can remember are seeing the lights being turned on and off. While I was by myself at that park, um, as if somebody was standing there switching it on and off. It was not flickering in a way that seemed like perhaps the light bulb was um, starting to die or having an electrical issue. It was being, it was as if it was purposefully being turned on and off. I could see that out of our uh, window through the park office and the light would turn on and it would kind of cast a glow across the trees and the grass. Um, and it caught my attention because it was something that um, should not have been happening. Those lights should have been turned off um, at, at that time of the day. Um, and, and I thought that was very odd. Um, and I never questioned it at first. Um, but as it happened more often, that's when I started questioning it. Um, I asked my supervisor about it and he kind of shrugged his shoulder, shoulders and said, you know, hey, you know, that's just kind of something that happens. I've gotten used to it and that was it for him. However, when I talked to Sue, some other employees um, that were, I think, a bit more aware of what was happening, um, they had a more in-depth uh, explanation as to what was going on um and they they had said that it was um a ghost that is known for that kind of activity um in the bathroom next to that office there um it was very common um and i i believed that it seemed more reasonable to me um in the way that, that it was happening so I did investigate. Um, I felt uh, brave enough to go next door um, because at the time it was just lights. So I thought, well, let me go over and investigate. And after getting the response from my supervisor, when he shrugged his shoulders and said, you know, that just kind of happens. I was curious to investigate myself. Um, so I did walk out of the park door and the lights were still going on and off um, in kind of a you know, a pattern, um, but not in a way that it seemed like an electrical issue. Um, it was it was curious enough for me to, to investigate myself. Um, so I did have a key that was, um, that access that, that bathroom there. Um, and of course I knocked and I asked if there was anybody in there. I might've done that twice uh, just to make sure. Um, however, at that time of the day, I knew that there was most likely nobody there. There should have not been anybody there. Um, so I did open that door and 
when I opened the door, the light stayed on. Um, the activity completely stopped as I walked inside of that room. Um, I didn't hear any switches. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. I checked the stalls. Um, I tried to see if, you know, there might have been any kind of short circuiting happening anywhere from the light bulb. And I saw no evidence of that. Um, the activity had completely stopped. The light stayed on while I was in the room. Um, so I stayed there a while and I wanted to see what would happen. Um, I maybe stayed there for about five minutes and I just waited um, and nothing. The, the light continued to stay on. So I thought, well, maybe I am overthinking this. So I left um, and I turned the light switch off um, and I closed the door behind me and locked it and went back to the office that I was in and I was in the office for about 15 to 20 minutes more um, and the lights continued to flicker as I sat there. I, I, I kind of just, you know, understood that that was a thing that was gonna keep happening. I did not go back to investigate. Um, I thought that it was very odd that it started up again as after I left the room. Um, so at that point, I was starting to not get the best vibes from that. So I decided to be safe just to kind of go on with the rest of my day, knowing that that was going to be happening throughout the day. It was early morning. Um, the sun hadn't quite come up um, yet in the morning, so it was dark. Um, you know, I would, I would call it, you know, kind of dawn time um, where there was a little bit of a glow in the sky, but it was mostly dark still. So it was obvious that that light was going on and off. I could see the glow from that light kind of cast across the, the grass. For my experiences, I was only there for about a year and a half. Um, and the other employees had been there for quite some time. Um, and which I think allowed them to experience more than I did. But I will say during my time there, and specifically my time alone there, um, even if there was one other person, perhaps my supervisor in the park, he might have been on the other side of the park, well out of earshot, well out of you know my, my visibility. Um, and when I had those moments alone in the park, and I'd have to say those moments happened at the front of the park, at the gate. And it was this, kind of overwhelming sense that I had and it was not a good feeling that I had. Um, I felt kind of a heaviness around me. Um, I felt like the air was weighted and I felt a presence that might have been watching me from afar. Um, not somebody like standing next to me or anything like that. It was kind of like I had this sense of a large presence that was watching me while I was there. Um, and I did not get a good feeling from that. As I thought about these accounts, um, and I kind of remembered the emotions and the feelings um, that I had during them, um, I would say the strongest feeling that I had during these experiences was a sense that I was not wanted there. Um, I, I felt like when I was at the front of the park there, it wanted me to continue going. It wanted me to continue leaving the park. Um, it knew that I was there and I was not wanted. Um, I, it was, you know, he was, it was not a very comforting or warm feeling, um, this presence. Um, it, it did not want me there. Um, you know, though I never heard anything, um, I it was just a feeling that I had, um, and it was very overwhelming. If I had to venture a guess, talking with other employees and other patrons of that park um, as to what the presence was that I was feeling um, and sharing similar stories with them, I would have to venture to guess that our stories line up for it to be Red Eye. Some time had passed before I had visited that park again. I had moved on to another job um, and I just never had the chance to go back and visit that park, um, especially in the evenings. Um, but there were a couple of chances that I got to spend some time in that park again in the evenings. And though I never got a feeling of any kind of, um, you know, sense that I 
I was not missed when I was there um, as I left. But when I did come back, I've got a sense that the entity was not happy that I was back. It, it, I felt like it recognized who I was with my time there. Um, and it was unhappy that I was back again. I would describe King's Landing um, as the place where there are some spirits that are stuck there. Um, they didn't mean to be there, but they are there. Um, and I feel like there is kind of an, kind of an aimless um, uh, feeling about them um, that they perhaps want to move on um, or confused um, and probably not happy to be there themselves. Um, I feel like they want to move on themselves. Um, and I feel that frustration from them when I, when I am there. Um, and I think because of that, when they see people come and go, I feel like that perhaps frustrates them as well. My experience actually started my first day um, when I was left to uh, begin my first shift closing by myself. Uh, this was during our summer hours. Um, so we're talking about me closing down the park between 7 to 8 p.m. in the evening. Um, so I actually wrote, I started tracking all my encounters so I wouldn't forget them all. Um, but so my first encounter um, was I was beginning closing down the park. Well, first I was in our office, uh, which is in the main hall, um, where I believe you guys have been before. Um, and I was there by myself doing some computer work um, and the toilets began to flush, uh, which is what I've heard is something that happens quite a lot. Um, which even now has pretty much happened anytime I'm by myself. Um, so the toilets began to flush, uh, which kind of psyched me out because um, I'm by myself. It's my first time closing uh, by myself. Um, I kind of just brushed it off, didn't really think about it. Um, I went off to uh, near where our maintenance area is, which is the building across from the meadow. Um, and I was locking up uh, and cleaning up the bathrooms that are there. Um, so I went into the men's bathroom um, and I heard a voice, uh, some like kind of behind me, um, kind of like someone was breathing down my neck, um, asking, um, who are you? Um, kind of in a, a deep uh, voice um, that, you know, kind of freaked me out. Um, no one was there. Uh, it was just me at this park at the time. Um, cause no one at the time is really hanging around around seven 30. It was getting quite dark. Um, and when I went to lock up the gate, uh, our front gate, um, it's quite dark there. Um, I had been warned by Ben that, uh, a certain spirit red eye likes to follow people to, um, the gate at night. Um, and when I was locking up the gate about to get my car, I heard, where are you going? Um, kind of far away, like maybe someone was standing behind the gate within the park. Like it, it sounded like from a distance. And that was my first day. Um, now I've been working there uh, going on about two months now. Um, anytime I'm by myself, uh, the flushing of the toilets is a constant thing for me. Uh, we're talking about maybe two to three times when I'm by myself. Doesn't really seem to happen um, when other people are around. There is an instance uh, the next week um, where I'm by the Cocktown cabins, uh, which are the ones by the hall, um, completely shrouded in the woods. I heard someone call my name. Again, this, was, this is me by myself when no one else is in the park, when I'm closing up everything, checking to make sure that no one's in the park, that everything's cleaned up. I heard someone call my name in that same voice that I had heard my first night. It was quite um, gravelly, um, like someone is talking with the base of their chest and maybe as deep as they possibly can go, um, wow. is, okay. is how I 
it's how I remember it and how it made me feel. Um, like someone is trying to establish some sort of dominance is how I took it. Um, and it was the same the three times that I've heard these phrases all throughout the same. Um, the you know the same cadence, the same tone of voice, the you know, the same characteristics of the voice. Um, it, it doesn't sound like anybody that I've met in the park. Um, and when this is happening, I am by myself, and it's so clear to the point that I know that I'm not like psyching myself out and hearing it it's so perfectly clear like you're talking to me now it's like someone is right next to me talking to me there was also a time when i was by myself this was last week um we have a sign that we put up um within the hall if we are about to leave or if our building is closed um it's kind of it's one of those heavy signs um it, it it takes quite a bit of my effort to move it. Um, I was sitting in the office. Um, it was sitting um, by our door, and suddenly I kind of heard like something was rocking. And I looked up from my computer, and the sign was just moving back and forth, like someone had pushed it with effort and was rocking back and forth. Um, and that was kind of the same day where. Um, our lights in the hall began to flicker as well. Um, I don't know if that is a common thing. It was never brought up to me that that was something that happens where our, um, the lights in the hall would flicker with purpose. <laughs> um, I've also experienced by our archery course area and the Mohawk cabins, um, where I believe that's where Mary's amphitheater is there. Um, just a feeling of utter dread and depression and sadness within that area. I haven't personally come in contact with Mary, who is another spirit, I believe, that's in that area. Uh, I think Ben has talked about before. Um, I haven't come in contact with her. It hasn't, nothing weird has happened except for the, the feeling that absolutely heavy feeling that's in that area and it's like I don't feel that anywhere else in the park um just like there's bricks on my chest is how it's how it feels when I go through that area and I kind of stay away from that area it's also very quiet in that area um completely unnatural silence it feels um whereas everywhere else in the park except for the Cocktown cabin area is full of like birds and insect noises. Um, I have felt in the Cocktown uh, cabin area kind of like I'm being watched. I also don't go there very often. Um, it, it's also unnaturally quiet, but in a more sinister way, I feel. Whereas by the Mohawk cabins, I feel more depressed and sad but near the cocktown area i feel anxious uh nervous and i usually don't feel that way um and i've only ever felt that way in that area when i am by myself um which is kind of uncommon for me to feel that way um as of right now that is really all that i've experienced um but when talking to ben um, it's, he connected a lot of this to Red Eye, again, I'm not sure if, if that is who it is, um, but he feels that I may be being, um, singled out, um, for some reason. Uh, ben was there for quite some time, he was, he was working there for 15 years, and I actually, um, filled in his role when he moved on to a different career, um, so he was quite surprised. Um, that all this was happening. Um, oh, I totally forgot. Um, there was an instance, this was um, actually a few days ago. Um, we had a clock in our office that hung above our door, um, the door that enters into the office. And um, uh, my boss and I were um, sitting at our desks um, when our clock just 
seemingly flew off the off the nail that it was sitting on and broke um on our floor <laughs> um it wasn't just like oh it fell off the nail and it broke it it pretty much flew from the top of the door um to our other little desk that we have on the opposite side of the room personally for me it seems with, with the flushing of the toilets it's almost like clockwork when you're by yourself um at least from what i've experienced um it seems around certain times that it happens um like it's like um our toilets are motion censored however there's hardly anybody that's within the bathrooms i don't even go to the bathroom in the hall because of how psyched i am about that mm -hmm. uh, especially when i'm by myself um but it seems when i am by myself and i've had one other coworker who has mentioned it's happened to her a few times um it seems to be around uh noon when our boss may leave or other days he'll leave around 3 it seems that after that is when it happens mm. um or it'll happen um when we're about to close so around right now we close at 5 p.m. so mm. around 4 p.m. uh things will start to happen sometimes it'll happen early in the morning when we first get there so it's kind of like a oh good morning i'm going to flush the toilets and scare you for the rest of the day kind of thing um <laughs> so it it's it's become quite a pattern mary's area is um the place where i feel the most dread and depressing feel like i had mentioned before like kind of like um there's a huge pressure on my chest and immediately when i leave that area it's gone the only other place that i feel something quite to that level is the opposite side of the park by the other cabins the cocktown area by the hall where i feel as if i am being watched um by something where i feel extremely anxious head on a swivel kind of feel um and those are really the only two places in the park that i feel those height like heightened emotions and anxiety and depression even with even in the hall with all that flushing and all the stuff that's going on i don't feel that um those two areas are really where i'm feeling heightened emotions really what goes on my head is more so like i do get anxious when i am by myself um and things do happen i feel incredibly anxious though i try to not feel that way because i don't want to make it keep happening because maybe they could be happening because i'm showing that i'm anxious or i'm getting mm -hmm. nervous when i'm scheduled to work by myself i do get a little nervous and apprehensive hesitant i don't want to do it um especially when we were closing at 8 now you know it's not as bad because it's still light outside um so you don't have that dark atmosphere around you um right, right now um but it's still frankly anxiety inducing to um you know to work by myself especially in the hall um and you know I was forewarned about some of these things before I came to work at King's Landing uh the warnings didn't really prepare me for everything that's happened thus far before I came to work at the park Ben kind of gave me the rundown on the entities that are known there like Mary and Red Eye for example um with red eye he told me especially with the flushing in the hall that that's most likely him um just to be respectful uh not show that i'm getting upset by what's going on um so the first time that it happened of course you know i was i kind of ignored it i ignored him talking to me i ignored the flushing of the toilets um and when it happened again uh, a few days later and then you know it, it's continuing to happen most of the time if I'm by myself I say hey I know that you're here I'm doing work right now you know that's all that I'm doing I'm not trying to get in your space um is pretty much what I had established with red eye with mary again I haven't had much of a I, I haven't had any interactions with her except for the feeling in her area 
Um, but there was a time when I had to go into her area to fix a bench um, that had toppled over in her amphitheater area. I pretty much just introduced myself and who I was um, and that I was friends with Ben because I know that she was quite connected to Ben. Um, but I haven't heard anything from her or anything. I haven't even had, knock on wood, no experience with the Black Mass yet, um, at least to my knowledge. Um, but I've tried to kind of establish that Mm -hmm. Um, thus far with stuff happening in the hall and things talking to me, it hasn't really had an effect. Um, so I just try to continue to be respectful when I'm not anxious. (laughs) We are walking to the, uh, chest pack camping cabins. These, uh, cabins, you won't be able to see them yet, but they're, uh, the original YMCA cabins. We've only lost two in the some 40 or 50 years since this was a YMCA camp. Um, they have all been renovated to look as if they were brand new. Wow, okay. And we're actually going to be able to get inside. Now. A rare look inside. I was yeah. about to say, do we need to have some lightage to add to the ambiance? So, there was a uh, old park technician named John. John was with us for about three years. In three years, John, like all of us, had multiple experiences. But as far as this, oh dear, um, as far as this area down here, John is coming down in our uh, go kart one day, uh, closing up, and he sees a white form on the uh, right hand side here um and he's starting to come up on it in the gator and the gator's engine is is very loud so when he says he stopped when he heard a high-pitched scream you know how loud that had to have been absolutely um and so he stopped somewhere around here and just turned around and (laughs) said all right never mind um and then later on maybe About a year after that, he's uh, coming down again, doing his rounds. This time he's uh, walking and he gets right around the same cabin where he saw the form before. And this time he sees it uh, inside the window and uh, he hears another high pitched scream. Um, And this time he says it kind of faded away like fog. Wow. That's, uh, you should be seeing it now on the right here. Well, at least my eyes are adjusting the little steps there. Prancing deer. <laughs> this plaque here uh, marks uh, some of the history about the YMCA, and there's some photos there um, from when it opened. Old newspaper. So that was uh, the original name? Yes. Cocktown. And Camp Mohawk. Uh, yeah. Mohawk uh, we'll go to later. Okay. That's near the garden. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> what, what, I'm glad ben, one of us finds a piece. Ben, 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 ben doesn't sound like he's um, uh, agreeing too much with that. Um, so um, I don't know if I should use actual names filming for sensitive stuff. But uh, yeah, feel free to change names. So um, we'll call her Maggie. Um, Maggie uh, was a old volunteer in camper here when it was YMCA. Um, she's met uh, at least two staff persons, one of them was me, and uh, I was driving around so she could see it. First time since she was a little girl that she'd actually been able to take an actual tour of the place. She said the first time she'd actually wanted to come back to, to have one. Um, she said that one of the men who uh, worked at the camp was a predator, and she identified this cabin as the one where he abused her and three other girls, I believe it was. Wow. 
So the fact that John saw his ghost both times associated with this cabin kind of makes a little bit more sense to me now. Sure. And what, what's come to think of it, interesting about that is she wanted to get in, so I brought the keys and opened it up, and she identified this wall even as where they lined the girls up mm. um, during the abuse. And it was that window that John saw. And maybe that's just coincidence, but right. I find it an interesting little tack on. Um, I just met Maggie, uh, gosh, not even two months ago. Maybe. Okay. Wow. So what time frame would that abuse have been going on? Um, late 60s, early 70s, maybe. Wow. All right. So basically, this is classic stuff here. This would be haunted, abandoned cabin. <laughs> Which, uh, after re the renovations uh, were done, there was a snafu where more money was needed. Then when the money came in, the park manager got promoted upwards and COVID hit. And so these cabins have never actually been slept in for several years. Wow. So, okay. so again, one one wonders, you know. And, and therefore, that's why I went with abandoned because, <laughs> well, I mean, no one's been in it. Right. Uh, it's it's not run down by abandoned standards by it at all because you said it's been refurbished. Yes. But, yep. Right down to the bunk beds. All right. Well, I guess we can take a little peek then, huh? Since all we right. Have, yeah. uh, you have the keys. Mm -hmm. I'll let the camera follow you. I'll uh, guard your six. Give me a moment as I find out which of the four keys it is. And there are no lights. This just has that uh, that rustic feeling right there. This is uh, this is roughing it then, basically. So for yeah. sure, right? Yeah. windows back here mm -hmm. sometimes on these boards uh, you'll see where kids wrote and carved their names um, we didn't have those touched during the refurbishment oh nice leave a little bit of history right yeah in fact <laughs> Rick there's a, a Rick <laughs> right above <laughs> where we got that where Oh, oh, nice. I was here. I didn't even know it. And Scott? I feel like it's romper room. I see Rick and Scott. Yeah. Mike and Ben. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing is for sure, there's not a stitch of EMF in this place. This hasn't budged at all, which I wouldn't expect it to be any, because without any power, mm. why would there be? And now this, you still recording? Mm -hmm. This, <laughs> this could be mildly terrifying, basically. Yeah. You know, if you're out here, here you are in a cabin, you know, and hearing night noises and things like that. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the real deal right there. So there this, this is the haunted cabin. Uh, there's an incident a few years before that when um, we're doing the last ever Junior Ranger camp out here. And we're actually uh, camping, not in the cabins, uh, but just past it at a campsite, just uh, down the path here. And uh, Jackie, the park manager at the time, gave me permission to take the kids down with the keys and open up the cabin and kind of have some fun with them and you know try to scare them. But I chose this cabin because I was already kind of scared of it. I didn't know really anything at that point. 
but one of the little girls with us said she saw a pair of eyes and that moved us into the hall where uh, the black mass was first sighted attacking a kid, we'll call him Chris. Um, and that was my first run in with the black mass. Um, so was it that the black mass started here and followed us there or is it that I accidentally brought us to it? I don't know, but there's a, the ghost history of this cabin. Excellent. And I've unlocked it for you guys. So when's the last time someone has been in here? Uh, I come in here every few months just to check on things. Okay. Um, but I don't think I've been in here in the last six or seven. Gotcha. So now this is the one you thought was a uh, like the administrator or something? Like yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's the only such cabin. All the others look exactly like the ones that we saw. The addendum that one of the ones on the hill has a chimney. Gotcha. I got a weird feeling in here, though. Yeah? Yeah. Well, I was going to say, uh, after you get done uh, B-rolling, you might get a little uh, S-box. Or I can take over the camera one. Uh, uh, something that might be interesting for you guys is, so Maggie mm -hmm. said that she was abused in that cabin. If we're right, and this was administrator's cabins, this is where he would have been. This is where he would have stayed. Gotcha. Okay. Relevant point there for sure. Um, yeah, what do you want to do in here? I was gonna say, we, well, we can get a little table. We'll do a little uh, S-box. We could. Yeah, just uh, since we, I was gonna say, if I can, I can hold that while you get situated. We'll be sitting down on this, yeah. uh, you know. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Oh no! Hey, man, this actually makes for fantastic uh, B-roll. What are you talking about? So. <laughs> Is there anyone from the King family? Do if I tried these, yeah, go ahead. Right, please go. Did you all see the, you know, the temperature? Oh. At this point. So I don't know how much practice you all have had with the rods, mm -hmm. but rods move um, easily by body fluctuation, mm -hmm. meaning my breathing should make those things go almost buck wild right now. But look how straight they are, especially the one on my leg. Mm -hmm. I mean, the minute I say that, they start moving a little bit. But, so let's try this again. Are you not wanting to talk for a particular reason? If so, point both rods to my right. If there, uh, if uh, you just don't want to talk at all, point both rods to my left and I'll leave you alone on the rods here. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Because I want them to talk to us elsewhere. Mm. I'll be a man of my word. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, like, the rods move just on their own. This is what rods should look like mm -hmm. normally. Right. So, if nothing's happening, and I try to explain this to my ghost tour people all the time, when it looks like nothing's happening, but this isn't happening, something is in fact happening. That's just moving because of the vibrations of my mouth, 
in my lungs, in my heart. It's it's just the way they do. Mm -hmm. But if they're <laughs> then mm -hmm. something's going on. Right, right. Yeah. While exploring the woods of the park, we encounter a first for the Unexplained Cases team. On our FLIR, we capture what appears to be a floating ball of heat observing us. Oh, what the hell is that? It just went... Oh, did, did, did you see it? I did. There it is. Bro. See? It was peeking around. It's gone now. Oh, oh, oh. It's moving. Like behind that tree. If anyone's here across the road, uh, okay. Are multiple of you here? Okay. Are we, do you know who we're seeing on the, the camera there? If so, cross the rods. All right. Is that red eye that we're seeing? That's a, that's a hell yes, actually. We turn off our lights to just listen to the forest and take in our surroundings. This is the darkness of the forest, pitch black. While we're listening, we record what can only be described in Bigfoot communities as tree knocking. This way, because you see me in it sitting here, and so the figure that was looking up was mm -hmm. in the distance over there. In this video, captured many years ago, it's clear something is in the background. Ben believes it to be a ghostly figure looking upwards. While it appears to be a figure, there are many trees surrounding this fire pit area. It's possible this is a light source creating pareidolia on a tree. And we're actually going to go over there. This is where Mary's garden is. Oh, there you go. Um, but we always, always, always get divine activity. And we get all three of them. <clears throat> Is there more than two spirits here right now, willing to talk on the rods? If so, cross the rods in front of me. If not, separate both rods to my shoulders. All right then. All right. So is it, if there's two spirits that are wanting to talk, point both rods to my left, and if one or less, point both rods to my right. Okay. So I'm just gonna take a stab in the dark. Uh, Red Eye and Mary. Uh, that's interesting. One of the rods is moving. Hmm. So in my experience, that means that they're both trying to talk at the same time and they're kind of fighting over it. So, um, uh, red eye. Alright, 
go with what's in my bag now. Alright, so Red Eye, uh, Rick and Mike would very much like you to show yourself in some way other than the rods. Are you able to do that? If so, cross the rods in front of me. Are you willing to do that? All right, so you guys take it away. Much yeah. of the paranormal activity is attributed to three entities. Mary's Garden is an area within the park dedicated to Mary Gretchel on August 25th, 2005. She was 15 years old and a member of the Chesapeake Theater Company. Mary passed away from complications of a virus. And while she didn't die on the property, Ben believes Mary still visits King's Landing and has been experienced and even seen by multiple people. The Black Mass is a shapeless form that is darker than dark and was reported following the car of a former park ranger as she was driving a sick camper from the park who allegedly was made sick by the entity. Red Eye is the entity who seems to receive the most credit for activity. Named because campers experienced some unexplained activity and then saw in the darkness two glowing red eyes, this entity has been attributed to having a deep, gravelly voice, being a watcher and even a protector, causing toilets to flush, and much more. All right, Red Eye. If you're indicating that you're willing to show yourself other than the rods, can you touch this box, this gray box that's on this bench? All you have to do is make contact with it. While dowsing rods have confirmed some of this activity belonging to Red Eye, it's inconclusive how much or little he's doing on the property. All right, so every single maintenance guy has experienced something in here. Yes. Um, either a light turning on, turning off, or <coughs> being open or closed when it shouldn't have been, uh, hearing things in the room next door. And remember, they're coming in at least two hours before the park even opens. Right. Ooh, it feels good here. Seriously, right? Man. And um, this wall is the ladies' room that the uh, actresses of the Chesapeake Theater Company, Chesapeake Youth Players, lovingly called the devil's bathroom. <laughs> All right, then. And they call it that because what have been the experiences? Uh, toilets flush, all the doors slamming, light, which is a manual light, uh, turning off on them um, just by them stepping in. Uh, they've not seen anything, but it's in there that kind of the same things in here, doors, lights, except for them, they're actually seeing it happen. So um, we had a, a maintenance guy for a little bit named Wayne. Um, Wayne, when he heard that we had ghosts, became immediately interested, brought in some ghost equipment that he had on his phone and personally, and he started trying to find one. And one day, not using the ghost equipment, he came into the barn, broad daylight, again, maintenance crew doesn't work when the sun's not up. And he said, right here was a hanging young girl dressed in white. And he immediately asked me if anyone had killed themselves or been murdered here. And uh, I've got no record of that that I've been able to find. Um, so your theories are as good as mine on that one. But he he seemed genuine. And again, dressed in white. Hmm. Which, that's always one of the fascinating questions. Is like, you have these apparitions, and they're either in white or blue. Hmm. Sometimes brown. But it's like, the very common is, is white or blue. Right. Like a, yeah, like a white bed gown mm -hmm. you know like like they all die and put on these bed gowns yeah you know or like everyone everyone sleeps in you know uh <laughs> pajamas they're all uh you know back in the early day kind of yeah, thing it's always like victorian yeah right yeah blue white and black 
<laughs> well, yeah. And then the occasional lady in red, which, you know, that's even rarer, it seems like. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was teeing you up for that. Glad you took it. Man, I got a funky feeling right now. Yeah? Yeah. Fucking, fucking hairs on my back are standing up. A lot of people get funky feelings in this area. I've actually had to force the tour people sometimes to go this way and not just go back. Really? Mm-hmm. And it was in that camping field on the way up that the one medium that came on one of my tours left. So this down here is the uh, amphitheater that you saw the photos of uh, the kids building. Nice. Um, in fact, there's a plaque inside the hall there, right where he set up the live feed camera uh, on the opposite wall there. Mm -hmm. um, that thanks everyone who was involved, the theater company, but also the Gretchel family by name. sleeping, parked the gator right here and said he saw her right there. Okay. Well, was that during the day? Yeah. During the day? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that your thing with bobbers clicking back and forth? Um, they clicked at least once, I think. I'll hold them close. Hi, Mary. Rick and I came here. We're friends of uh, Ben's. Again, we've heard a lot about you. We just came to uh, say hello. And uh, hopefully, maybe you can say something to us. If you want to say something to Ben, you can say it into this little microphone where I'm pointing this little box up here. It's a little recorder that you can talk into. It'd be wonderful to hear anything from you, Mary. Can you let us know you're here? We've heard stories of you showing yourself to people. We would love to see you. Jackie and Kevin and Jesse miss you. Do you remember what it was like building this? Seventy-five point six. 
can you change the temperature to 75 degrees? Can you drop the temperature on that box around here? Hmm. And there's point zero. So <laughs> slow and steady runs the wins the race. Now if it stays there. Yes. <laughs> Mary, I guess we're going to move on. We thank you for an opportunity to visit. And we hope that you shared some form of a message. We'll be able to hear it when we listen back on these devices. Yeah, thank you, Mary. And there we go. Now, Mary, if you could honor us by keeping it at that, that would be great. Mm hmm. All right, now that's wild. <laughs> right? <laughs> Especially since theoretically it should be warmer at this level. Right. I mean, I could understand it being cooler on some rocks. That's more steady than it's been since we brought it up here. I think she just fulfilled that request. Very cool. <laughs> um, this shed, this is actually the painting that I did that got me my job 16 years ago. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I was helping with the amphitheater, and um, Jackie Waymeyer was having all of us kids paint, and I was painting the, the flat color you see on the walls there mm -hmm. and we were cleaning out this this had just gone to shit and mm. um we were going to be doing uh the play much ado about nothing and so oh. we we're trying to make everything look kind of italian nice so she liked the job i did and uh offered me the park tech job that november just out of high school very cool indeed and so we're trying to make everything look kind of Italian. Nice. So she liked the job I did. And, and so we're trying to make everything look kind of Italian. Nice. So she liked the job I did. And, and so we're trying to make everything look kind of Italian. Nice. So she liked the job I did. And One of the many experiments Unexplained Cases conducts during investigations is the use of playing cards in a spirit box to determine if an entity will voice the number, color, or suite of the card. It's a nice departure from asking questions and creates more of a game atmosphere. Listen for the responses. By his reactions, Ben was quite amazed. All right, I'm going to pull another one. Tell me the number, or the color, or the suite.
Thank you. That was good. You know what the sweet is? Do this again. Again, say the number or the sweet or the color. right on. Mary, are you here? Cross the rods in front of me for you. Are you the one working on the uh, EDI detector over there? Thank you, Mary. Are you having problems with the spirit box? Mm. Is it hard to figure out? Have others been trying? All right, just so we can see something other than crosses. Um, for yes answers, point to my right. For no answers, point to my left. Um, is it easy to work on the rods and also keep the EDI at 75? Did you let us know you were here through the EDI? Like, was that on purpose? One visit to King's Landing Park barely scratches the surface of collecting evidence. It's clear to us that many former campers and staff of this property have experienced activity that's not easily explained. How many more visitors to this park have yet to come forward and share their tales? It's safe to assume the activity continues today, and we hope to return and continue researching this open case. Reporting for Unexplained Cases, I'm Rick Garner. <laughs>